shot by McCormick is down in front. Come on, Ronnie, score! Harvard wins the national championship. So it does make me think of some lighthearted stories before we get you know, into um, maybe the bean pod and into the tournaments and on the path towards a national championship. And so I'm going to share one with you. And I'd love to hear if each of you have a story, whether you want to make fun of me or somebody else on the team. But I think about um, the ECAC quarterfinals against RPI. And uh, we swept that series. And I played the first game against RPI. We won 7-3. And I don't know if I told you guys this story, but um, they granted... Uh, Bruce Cole's penalty shot against us. And I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, and Pierre, Pierre Belanger was the referee. And so get ready to have the, the, um, the penalty shot. And I was traumatized as a teenager because Neil Carnes, who was a first round draft pick of the Hell Olympics, Ted, you might've played with him on a world junior team and he died in a motorcycle accident, God rest his soul. Um, I had a penalty shot against him and I stopped it. But the Canadian biased officials said that I came out of the crease before he reached the blue line. So he got a shot and he came in and he scored on me. So I turned to Pierre. I'm like, Pierre, hey, can I come out when he touches the puck or do I have to wait till he gets to the blue lines? And he goes, I can't tell you. And then he walks away. So I'm sitting in the crease getting ready for this penalty shot. Now we're up 7-2. So I wait till he gets to the blue line. So I'm late coming out to challenge him. And he comes down and he snipes and he scores on me. And then Pierre comes over and picks up the puck. He goes, you can come out when he touches the puck. I'm like, you son of a gun. Come on, Pierre. Why didn't you tell me beforehand, right? And, of course, coaches give me a hard time. Why didn't you come out of the net? And I don't want to tell him why because then I want to look like I didn't know the rules. So I think that was one of the other parts. Like maybe we were talented enough to overcome our shortcomings, in this case mine. But – I'm curious if you guys have any other funny uh, stories that you might want to share with the audience here. There, there's, a, there's a laundry list, and, there's, and I'll kind of maybe weave in two quick ones, which was we did have fun, right? We had a great group of guys. Everyone got along really well, and we're all competitive, but we're really a low ego group, right? It was really a group that just wanted to win together and see everyone do well. But, you know, one of the characters on our team was Kevin Melrose, um, mm -hmm. who was such a great addition to our team, had come in from a plate of North uh, at Notre, North Dakota, right? North, North Dakota. Dakota. And then transferred in. and But he added a physical element and just a really good player, good guy, very underrated. But Kevin was a practical joker. And so I remember up at St. Lawrence, we tried to go back and forth a little bit. But there was, after we played Clarkson in the first of a back-to-back, -back, and it was a big weekend because St. Lawrence was, I think, ranked first in the country, we all went to the Pizza Hut just across the street. And a few of us, while Kevin went over the Pizza Hut, took every piece of furniture from his room we put it outside the back door in the snow and set it up like a bed, bedside table, lamp, the whole thing in the snow, which is where you had to enter back into the hotel. And so Melly, Kevin Harris being who he is, you know, loved to dish up radical jokes, didn't like to be on the receiving end, then ripped around the hotel for 45 minutes trying to figure out who did it and who was he going to beat up because they did it. So <laughs> that was one Kevin Harris. My other quick Kevin Harris story was, I think it was late in the year, and all of a sudden, someone realized the mic is on in the penalty box. And Kevin Melrose goes over and grabs the mic in the penalty box and starts singing the Canadian National Anthem <laughs> at full throttle, right, all over the PA system. And so it was just kind of one of those, I think it would, we were maybe heading out to the NCAAs that week, and guys are just messing around. But sort of that, that fine balance of having fun while really pushing hard and preparing well. So those are a couple of stories that come to mind. Does anybody, can anybody, I, oh, go ahead, Edzo. No, I just had another Melly story that might surprise a lot of people, but I remember um, when we used to go on long road trips, um, you know, say Cornell or something, or Clarkson St. Lawrence, you know, six, seven hour bus rides. Usually at the back of the bus, you know, there was the Al Borbo poker game or whatever game you guys were playing in the um, you parks or whatever. And then uh, I, I was at the front of the bus playing Trivial Pursuit with Dean Jewett. And, and then in the middle of the bus was Melly, who had just come from out of town news agency. Remember that place back when it existed? He would buy the, the newest computer science magazines, like computer magazines. And he would read them for hours and hours on the bus. And I thought, <laughs> really? <laughs> like, I was expecting, I don't know, Green Eggs and Ham or uh, you know, <laughs> Mad Magazine or something. I wasn't expecting... Uh, 
you know, modern computer science or whatever. I, I that always added a little bit of an interesting element to the to the to the, um, to the aura of Kevin Melrose. We also had a lot of fun with each other, and I think one gaffe that one of our players had, Ted Lane, I don't know if you want to take it, was um, the T-shirt that I believe Mr. Carone had uh, constructed. Does anybody want to tell that story? And you know, I think that's worth a couple laughs. So it was kind of a big T-shirt day, you know, era. Um, but Nick Carone um, had this great idea that he was going to create a T-shirt and have three boxes. You know, I believe one would have been the bean pot, one would have been the, you know, the ECAC championship, and the other one was going to be the national championship. And all three boxes, you know, would, uh, you know, would would have to be checked, and 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 they were just going to be, you know, selling like hotcakes uh, on campus. And uh, unfortunately, we lost the ECAC in the middle of the, uh, you know, of the uh, the great investment uh, of uh, of t-shirt money. So. It, it didn't work out, which um, was probably a, um, you know, a small consolation for, for the rest of us uh, as far as losing. But it was it was pretty funny. Well, well thought out by Nick. It just uh, it just didn't uh, didn't pan out. Do you have any other fond stories? Uh, you know, that can be funny or real about any of the other players, um, you know, that, you, that we played with so that year? So I may throw in one about uh, Paul yeah. Howley, right? In terms of we had so many great guys on that team, Paul being one of them, and he and Eddie Perez being such good friends and kind of anchoring that line with Harch. Um, but when we were over in Sweden and Finland that year, kind of doing the tour, and we had a great time. It was a great experience. We went over to Finland, Sweden, played against professional teams over there, and we did okay in a couple of games, and we got thumped in a couple of games, which was, once again, great kind of put us back in our place, know how hard we had to work. Um, but we were sitting at dinner one night and we had had, if I'm not mistaken, reindeer the night before and we're now having <laughs> rabbits for kind of this next meal. And Paul Halley stands up and says, in the dinner and we've got Coach Cleary and, and Mrs. Cleary, Ron Tonsoni and his wife, um, Jack Reardon was there if I'm not mistaken, Fran Tolan, so a lot of people stands up and says, First Rudolph, and now the Easter Bunny is nothing sacred in this country. So, <laughs> and that was kind of, I think, you know, just there was just so many fun late moments along the way. There was the boat ride from Stockholm to Finland, or from Finland to Stockholm. I can't remember which way we went, and it was just kind of like a fun getaway. So, so many good guys, so many great characters. You know, Brian Popeil is a funny guy. Um, the team Cappy, Josh Kaplan, one of the funniest guys. So we just had so many good guys in so many good stories. But Paul Howley, that line, I will never forget that line at that dinner uh, when we were over in Europe. That was great. Um, and so what was your take on the trip to Europe? That was my first trip, you know, outside of the U.S. and Canada as a kid whose parents didn't go to college. It was pretty amazing. Like, what was your take on the trip to Sweden and Finland? Oh, I, I mean, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, from a hockey perspective, we got to play in the big European ranks against some really top-notch uh, Finnish and Swedish teams. Um, a couple of them were close games. A couple of them not so much. I, mean, I remember losing one game, 6-1, 7-1, maybe maybe even worse. I mean, we got our asses kicked a couple times. But um, um, but that was all part of it. But more importantly, it was the off the ice stuff, right? The, 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 the fun, the shenanigans, the boat ride from uh, Finland, Sweden, uh, the skits. Remember, we did we did skits. You know, we sort of celebrated Christmas together over there, and we did some Yeah, but we promised not to talk about those in this show this evening. No, <laughs> we won't. I won't go into detail. But I will say this, you know, back to, like, Cappy and Duke Howley. You think about those guys in the corner of the locker room all year long. I, I would put that comedy duo up against anyone from Saturday Night Live any day of the week. I mean, pure humor, nonstop. Um, ECAC tournament. Um, I'd love to get your take, guys, in terms of, you know, that Vermont game and getting upset in the Boston Garden. And, you know, do you guys think we took that one too lightly or just one of those days where the puck didn't bounce for us? I don't think we I don't think we took them lightly. I mean, they, they were a good team, right? They, they had a lot of talent. They had a lot of speed. Uh, we had, we had a couple good games against them during the regular season. Um, I just think that uh, we, we, we had a bad we had a bad day. Um, 
you know, we were playing at the garden where we'd never really had much success, right? That smaller ice surface, UVM traveled well, they had a huge crowd there. Um, but one thing I remember about that particular segment of the season was that things were starting to happen a little too easily for us. We, we were winning games uh, where we weren't on our A game, so to speak, and maybe things were coming a little bit too easily for us. That, that as painful as it was at the time, that provided us with a little bit of a, of a, of a check, a check up. Like, hey, you know what? You're not as good as you think you are. You, you do need to show up and play and play well if you're gonna if you're gonna win. And so that was a little bit of a reality check for us. I think, in hindsight, it was also it was also a game that we lost Scott McCormick. You know, um, mm-hmm. broken arm. You know that 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 hurt. Yeah, and he was a key right-handed shot defense for us. Who you know just did his job right. Played solid defense. Was a breakout machine. Um, it's interesting you say that, and and Lane or Teddy, I'd love, you know, to hear your take. Like, I think our defense were tough and incredibly good defensively, but they never got the accolades that you know you forwards did. And I'm teasing on that side of things, but we were known as a fast skating, high powered offensive team, and yet, you know, we had a very strong uh, defensive core. I'd love for somebody to just talk a little bit about those seven guys, eight guys who played during the year and what they meant to us as a team. So to, to Chuck, listen, I, I think it's so well said, and I think it's back to a little bit of the selfless nature of our team, because it was not a group that wanted the accolades, nor were they looking to kind of do too much offensively. They really kind of knew their role in how to kind of make our team better. But one of the great things about that team was they moved the puck so incredibly well, right? Scott McCormick, Brian McCormick, um, Nick Carone, uh, Kevin Snetty, right? You kind of go down that whole the whole thing, Kevin Melrose, like you go down the whole group, but they moved the puck so well and it's so underappreciated from a team standpoint about you can't do anything as a forward if you can't get the puck and you don't get the puck in the right place and get going. But that those guys we're so good at moving the puck and making the right play and making the right decision, which is brilliant in so many ways, but so underappreciated and obviously so good defensively in their own zone. So it started obviously Chuck with you and Al in the, in the back, right? Kind of playing a little bit of traffic cop, helping them, talking to them, telling them what's happening. But man, I, I really feel like those guys did so much that were little things underappreciated but really made us able to score, have games where we were scoring nine or 10 goals, right? Because we were getting the puck in the right place at the right time and able to do things. Yeah, and, and they are, you know, the epitome of selflessness. Um, let's talk about the bean pot. Teddy, you're a Boston kid like me. You'd played in a bean pot the previous year, um, but Harvard hadn't won, I, at least in 10, 12 years, I think, the bean pot. Um, what did that season's bean pot mean to you? And what did you think about playing in the bean pot during your time at Harvard? Well, for me, I, I always, um, you know, people ask me about, you know, you know, being able to play, uh, you know, in the Boston garden for the Bruins. But to me, to me, the first time I, I felt like I had really made it was, was when I stood on the, on the blue line for the bean pot, you know, I mean, uh, as a kid, you know, I had a million, uh, you know, street hockey games and, uh, you know, uh, we used to actually play with socks back then. That was kind of a, a you know, kind of a cool thing to have, uh, you know, socks be the ball in the living room. But we were always the beanpot schools. We would introduce ourselves. And we had, you know, four boys in the family. And those are some physical games. I can tell you, mom and dad went out to dinner and, uh, you know, there was no, uh, there was no timeouts and no penalties. So, uh, but the, the, uh, the bean, the beanpot was, was really important. I think it was, you know, it really was for bragging rights uh, in the city of Boston. And, um, you know, I think, I think for us, it was also kind of, um, you know, a a chance for us to kind of, um, you know, put ourselves to a test a little bit, you know, I mean, back then, you know, you looked at, you know, uh, BC was, you know, uh, you know, a final four kind of caliber team. BU was good. Northeastern was good. And those games too, the, the emotions, you know, would run so high because of the crowd that, you know, it, on, on any given night, anything could happen. Um, so, so I think it was, uh, the bean pot to me, I would have been, uh, devastated if we weren't able to win a bean pot in, in the four years, 
you know, at Harvard. And uh, I just felt coming in with guys like Lane and, and Eddie and, and Al be back and having guys like Kevin Melrose and Scott Farden and, and, you know, having someone like yourself and Al that to me, I knew would, would hold up to the pressure. I, I felt really good going in and, you know, uh, it didn't mean that it was easy, but, uh, but I did, I did feel like we had a, a great opportunity going into the bean pot that year. And, you know, what I think people who are younger don't realize, and we are all really lucky to play in a sold out Boston garden in the old garden. I mean, it's still great to watch a bean pot now or to go to a Bruins game. It can get loud, but that old rink where it's on top of you and you can feel the glass shake and you can hear that noise of whatever it was, 15,000, where now it's 19,000. It was incredible and, and pretty deafening. So it's, it was an amazing experience for me to be able to play in that in high school, but then to play in it at Harvard and have success was really uh, you know, phenomenal. I mean, Eddie, I'm sure you feel the same way as a Boston kid. You know, what was your yeah. like, you know, favorite bean pot memory? Well, certainly winning it in 89 was my favorite bean pot memory because the, the prior years we didn't have much luck. And I can tell you, one of the things that drove me crazy about that was, you know, 86, 87, 88. We were the team of the four Boston schools that went to the final four every year. We were the ones playing in the national championship game. BU, BC, and Northeastern did not make it to the pros in any of those years. So we were clearly the program that was having the most success at the national level, but we couldn't win the bean pot. And it drove me crazy because a lot of the kids that I grew up with playing with in youth hockey and I played against them in high school hockey, they played for BC and BU. And it drove me crazy that we that we couldn't beat them. Um, of course, back then with the Harvard calendar being what it was, we were always at a little bit of a disadvantage coming to the uh, but at the end of the day, it's just it drove me crazy that we didn't do better. And that year we won it. It was great. It was like a, kind of a, a relief. I mean, yeah, it was fun to win it. And there was a nice, but it was a little bit of a monkey off the back feeling afterwards. And then, you know, another uh, another fun memory from Beanpot 89, when we got back to the campus that night, um, uh, I remember one of my roommates was the producer of the footing show. And that was the night that they had the debut and they had Kathleen Turner was the woman of the year. And she uh, was out hanging out with all the students. And I thought it was pretty cool to hang out with Kathleen Turner after winning the bean pot. 